and welcome to the LA Goals podcast, Success Uncovered, featuring LA's most successful game changers. I'm your host, Essie Magic. And today we have the founder of This Is A Love Song, aka Tile, Stephanie Shrikandi. So excited to have her here. She's also a business coach. She designed uh, This Is A Love Song, and she's also a fashion consultant, which makes her the perfect guest for today, because we are going to be talking about what to expect in this upcoming year in the fashion industry and all the changes and everything that you can do to adapt to it and keep up with it. Uh, with that being said, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Essie. I'm so excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this podcast and we're finally here and we're making it happen. Yeah, so have I. And you are currently in Bali, right? Yes, I'm currently quarantining in Bali. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a crazy year, but I'm glad to be back home. Um, so I do miss LA and hopefully I'll be able to travel really soon when things clear up. But things have been really busy here. So, you know, I've been working nonstop for my brand and also my production. And now that I'm launching an online course, I really haven't stopped at all. Um, so it's wow. great. But yeah, sometimes I'm like, I wish I can take a little bit of a break when some people are like, oh, I'm not doing anything in quarantine. I'm like, uh, I'm working like 10, 10 hour days. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way, to but it's that. good. That's what you got to do for sure. And with yeah. that being said, I think it'd be great if you could tell the listeners at home about yeah. you and your business. Uh, I think they would love to hear in your own words. Yeah, so I guess I'm a serial fashion entrepreneur. I've always loved fashion ever since I was a little girl. So I knew that I wanted to do something in fashion. But first I thought, okay, I want to be a fashion designer, you know, like every little girl's dream, right? And then eventually after high school, I was looking at university and I, I discovered that they had a fashion business uh, class. So I ended up thinking, you know what, I'm not really good at drawing and all of that, but I really am interested in having my fashion brand. Maybe this is something that I, you know, would be, uh, would be more smart for me to take on board for two years. And then if I wanted to go into design, then I would, you know, add that on. So I ended up doing a fashion business course in this Canadian college for two years. It was like a diploma course. And then after uh, being in school, I ended up getting a job at a Italian fashion company in Bali as a visual merchandiser. And so I had an opportunity to go back to school, but then, I don't know, I felt like the real world was teaching me a lot more. And my mind was already set about creating my own brand. But at the time, I actually started a jewelry company way before This Is A Love Song. So that was my first brand and it was called Rebirth. And I started making silver jewelry because um, in Bali, they have a really like amazing silversmiths or schmitz or whatever you call it. My accent is a little bit funny. <laughs> it's <sometimes>. okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had this jewelry company and um, I made that. I had that for about two and a half years. And then I opened a store in Bali as well. And that's how I started This Is A Love Song because the store, I had to fill it in with product. So I only had a jewelry line. And so I was like, maybe I need to, you know, create some clothing, but what do I do? And at the time we didn't have Zara. We didn't have, you know, casual wear in Bali. It was mostly resort wear or souvenirs, you know, like those Bali shirts, or if you go to Cancun, like those type of shirts, this yeah. was back in 20, no, 2000, 2009, 2008. So yeah, anyway, so I saw that there was like a, a gap in the market here and I was in my early 20s at the time and I was just so sick of going to Singapore having to go overseas to like get things I, I don't know if it's like that in Ghana but you're like you go somewhere and then you <laughs> you basically buy everything and then you <laughs> go back you know even like all your cosmetics so yeah I I was like I'll, I'll make a line of t-shirts and I was collecting vintage uh, material from when I was traveling so I would cut these like vintage material basically upcycle these vintage shirts and cut the pockets and then put them in on these organic cotton t-shirts. And so I had that line and I just called it, this is a love song without even really thinking because I saw an interview in Nylon magazine and I was looking for a name and I was like, this sounds really nice. You know, it sounds very like 
like lovely, like a lot of brands in Bali at the time were very like aggressive sounding or like depressing. So I wanted something a little bit more cheerful. So yeah, I had the line and because a few of my friends, Bali is pretty known for um, their production. A few of my Australian friends, they had their brand. So I basically asked them, hey, do you want to put your stuff in my store? You know, maybe it's stock that you cannot sell or it's overproduction. So I had, you know, a bunch of these Australian brands as consignment in the store, which was called This Is A Love Song. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how the brand started. I didn't really plan it, um, but it really like did well because I guess being the only um, boutique in Bali and it was in a prime location, you know, a lot of, it was like really fresh. It was fresh on the scene. And at this time, I think a lot of younger designers were also, you know, being more creative in Bali. So I kind of mm -hmm. gave them the platform for it. So then fast forward two years later, you know, in, the, in those two years, I, I kind of started to develop more products because I was just a little bit bored of creating t-shirts. I was like, I need to make more things because I was mainly making things that I also wanted to wear. Cause I would get compliments like, Hey, that dress looks cute, blah, blah, blah. So then I ended up making a collection and it was like a 40 piece collection. And oh, wow. I just started reaching out to um, agents. Cause I was like, Oh yeah, maybe, you know, there's people out outside of Bali that is, that are interested in carrying the line in their stores. So yeah, I reached out to a bunch of agents and then one agent replied in New York and she was like, Oh, I love this collection. And she's like, I want to, you know, set a meeting. And funnily enough, that was my first trip to the States. I had already booked oh, wow. the trip. And I was like, I'm actually coming. And I'm going to New York. It was my first time in New York. And she was like, great, bring your samples. So then I <laughs> packed up, you know, all my samples in the suitcase. And I remember flying into New York. I was so, like, excited, but also nervous. Um, and I was flying with, um, with a friend and I mean, thankfully I wasn't alone. Um, but yeah, I landed in this big city and I felt like it was the sex in the city moment or like oh, a yeah. movie moment, you know, <laughs> where you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is such a different world. So we set up the meeting and yeah, they really loved the collection. And she was like, I want to sign you. I can get you in this store, this store, this store. She was naming all the stores that I really I was like admiring those stores, like Nasty Gal and all of that, you know, oh, this wow. was that era. Yeah. It makes me sound old, but yeah, um, it was Revolve, like, you know, this was 2012, 2012. So yeah. yeah, so basically she signed us and I left the samples with her and literally like a month in, I had my first uh, order and it was like from Nasty Gal, $30,000. And I was like, whoa this is amazing. Wow. I was like, what? And I, I, I was just so excited. But then they were like, yeah, you're gonna have to produce it. And, it, you know, I was like, where's the deposit? And she was like, no, they don't <laughs> place deposits. You have to produce it. Or if you cannot deliver, then that's it. And I was like, oh my God. So when I got back from the States and I was in Bali, it was like crunch time. You know, I had to figure it out. But thankfully I had my store. So you know, my store basically was able to fund that. Um, so I did wholesale for, from that point on for like two and a half years to three years, I was basically wholesaling. And that was my primary uh, business model besides the store in Bali. So I wasn't really focusing on online sales and things like that. I was literally just selling my product to stores in the States and they would resell it, but it was doing really well. And you know, this wasn't the time where Instagram was really big. It was at the mm -hmm. beginning of Instagram. So I wasn't really utilizing that as well. And like, I think we had a Facebook page and it was very primitive, <laughs> but it was really great for us because it got us a lot of attention. You know, we got a lot of celebrity attention. We had a lot of PR attention. The agency also had like a, a PR department that was helping the product to get into magazines. So it was, it was more of a traditional approach compared to, you know, now that we're like this year, well, the past two, two years, I would say. But um, yeah, I always kept my production in Bali. So that was like another thing I produced here, but I had one factory that I was working with and they just, 
weren't treating their workers, you know, fairly. And like, I, I just heard stories about them paying like really, really low wages. And it just felt really wrong for me to continue working with them. So I think after our first season and we got a bunch of orders, I was like, I need to do something about this. And I ended up opening my studio and it was first, I think three sewers. So I bought like three sewing machines. Um, and then I had like a pattern maker helping me with creating the samples. Cause even though we're producing, we had to, you know, make new collections and give it to the agent. Right. So it was like a very, very small operation. And I didn't know, you know, how to run a production, a garment production company. I basically was like, all right, let's, let's see how this goes. And I, yep. you know, learned by doing, but yeah, that, that is now my other business towel studio, which is, you know, I, I didn't plan this one as well. I guess you could say I didn't plan really both my businesses. So now I'm a brand consultant too. And I produce for a lot of um, worldwide, like brands, small brands and uh, bigger brands. So I've produced for Pornhub. I know that's funny, but they have their merch <laughs> line. So I produce for them. I produce for uh, merchandise for artists like Major Lazer and, and Zed. And then I also produce for smaller brands like Australian brands that are starting um, but we're all about ethical production so yeah I'll tell you about this I guess as we go in I feel like I'm <laughs> I just keep talking and talking but yeah so that is um, Tao Studio and it's it's more my passion because you know we give back to the local community in Bali nice. and that's that's part, you know, part of the reason why I'm back uh, the past year, we've just had a lot more orders. So I had to go back and just really kind of grow and expand our business here. Because running a production company, it's a whole different ball game. I thought, you know, like running, running a fashion brand is fun, um, but running a production company and then you're dealing with clients and all of that, it's, it's like having 10 brands at the same time. Wow. So, <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, I, I love what I do. And I guess that's why I, you know, decided as well, like I want to teach my knowledge. And uh, I started opening, I started a TikTok account and that TikTok account was primarily about fashion business and sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. And I just got a bunch of followers. And, you know, I think my boyfriend was like, maybe this is something that you need to, you know, really a kind of package into like a mini course or whatever because it seems like you know a lot of people are interested in starting their brand and they don't know how and also I see this a lot with my clients that I work with you know especially smaller brands you're a one person team and yep. you don't know all the things that you have to basically oversee when you're running a fashion brand and it could be even the smallest details like forgetting about the garment label and they don't you know, they, they, they didn't think about that. So yeah, that's my new, my new project. And yeah, we'll be discussing this, I'm sure in more detail. But yeah, I guess that's a, a nutshell <laughs> about me. <laughs> yeah. I can keep rambling. But yeah, so that's why I'm a serial fashion entrepreneur. That's what I call myself. I play a lot of different hats in the fashion industry. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you definitely have you know, you've been through a lot as you, you spoke about now. So it's great that you're teaching others and you're sharing that with others so that other people yeah. can start their own clothing line um, as well or enter your yeah. studio, as you mentioned. And even the point that you mentioned yeah. about how when you got the order, you realized, oh, gosh, I got to pay for this myself, even though I have the I order know. coming in, I got to be able to cover it myself first. And I think a lot of young fashion entrepreneurs don't know that, right? So that's, yeah. that's really good bit of information. Yeah, they did not teach that in school. They were not like, hey, if you're going to get an order, you have to, you know, front this. We did learn, of course, about like the payment terms, like net 30 and net 15. So there's like parts of school that, of course, is so helpful. You know, all the textbook stuff. I learned a lot. But then I had no idea. And I was so excited about getting this order in. And then I realized, okay, well, I have to fund this. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's where I feel like you know, if you're not prepared for that, then you don't really, you cannot prepare for bigger growth. 
Yep, definitely. And I liked how you spoke about your international flavor, I guess you can call it how you um, you said you went to a Canadian school, you did some Italian schooling, you you have some connections in Australia, and then obviously you're in Bali, and we know you came to LA for a bit. Do you think those international influences really helped your expertise and helped you to shape your your business and your career? Yeah, 100%. Um, Bali is a melting pot. That's why my accent is very weird. And I think I said that before, because a little bit about my background, I'm half Indonesian and I'm half Dutch, uh, but I was born in Indonesia. And I only I've been living in Bali for the past well on and off the past 10 years. But Bali is great. It's a melting pot. And it's so international. Um, I left in 2015 to go to LA. And when I came back, I spent more time in 2018. For the first three years, I was literally more focused in uh, North America and growing the business there. But I had a bit of time off in 2018 for about a month and a half. And when I came back, I was just so amazed. Um, Bali is just so international and it it's almost like a big city in a small island. And there's so many people from New York, LA, Australia primarily, um, they all work here, or they're digital nomads, or they set up their business here. And because there's a really big fashion scene, like a fashion, um, a lot of fashion factories are here as well. So there's a lot of creatives in that industry. So yeah, I think it really influenced me a lot. I, uh, I managed to meet a lot of people being in Bali, um, because I was also doing events here. And when I was doing the events, it, you know, fashion and music go hand in hand. Um, so my brand, This Is A Love Song, uh, we marketed it as a music festival brand. And I was basically um, making events in Bali to support that for marketing and also just to have fun, you know? So we had a, a lot of uh, musicians come in and DJs and I was booking them. And so that's how I established a relationship with them as well. And it ended up being more than just the event. So I would end up um, I think for Major Laser, we sent them outfits for two shows, like two tours. And then we supplied, uh, we designed uh, an outfit, no, five outfits for the dancers for their music video. So nice. yeah, it's kind of, you know, you have to weave in what you love doing and kind of make it into a business, I guess. So that's what I do. <laughs> but yeah, yeah Bali, Bali is great for that. And I don't know if you've ever like, um read about like digital nomads in bali i think it was named number one in forbes in 2018 oh wow oh so, yeah that. yeah it's very international here and i i was just really amazed in 2018 when i came back and i was like wow i think i could live here again so i was toying around with the idea but i didn't really um uh, make the move until last year got it okay yeah and speaking of major laser, I know, and you also mentioned you, you, you had celebrities pick up your, your clothing line as well. Can you talk about some of your biggest accomplishments um, as a fashion designer, as a fashion entrepreneur? Um, I know you've been in Fader Magazine, featured in yeah. Glamour, Paper Magazine, Forbes. I'd love for you to, or I'm actually just listing your accomplishments there, <laughs> but I would love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in your own words, what you consider your, your biggest accomplishment so far? Um, definitely the Forbes one. That was really, um, that was like on my bucket list of being featured in Forbes, um, especially for like a collection that we were launching about breast cancer. And we did this event in LA and it was a big, basically a, a boxing, you know, for, a, for this breast cancer awareness. So it was for this cause that we were promoting. And so we had this event in 2018 and it was covered in Forbes. So that was really, really cool. Before that, I primarily, um, we just got a lot of celebrity placement. And I think it was first to do with us being in stores in America through our wholesale. And so that really made us very legit, I guess. Like it made us um, a lot of, stylists maybe would have come to those stores and they you know pulled our brand because our brand was very bold and you know for magazine press you need to have standout pieces so we always made sure we had that so we had sequins we had just like things that people would like to wear for music festivals and so they would pull that and and it would be in the music video and sometimes it's not even through anyone we know it's just the stylist loved the piece 
And then one time we did strategically send stuff to Rihanna. So <laughs> we had to kind of do our investigation and put our detective cap <laughs> on and found her stylist and just bombarded him with like a bunch of packages. And then it ended up uh, that she wore a jacket and it was photographed in Daily Mail or one of those gossip magazines that she was running out of her studio wearing this jacket and it was winter in New York and she nice. was wearing her jacket and I was like oh my god I can't believe and she started following us too <laughs> nice. so that was that was that, that was my yeah that was definitely my big achievement then because I really I Brianna was my favorite or she is still my favorite so nice. yeah that was maybe I don't know 20 2016 I would say but we've had a lot of other celebrities wear our stuff. One time, Cara Delevingne just walked into the store in Bali. And wow. She was like, yeah, I heard about this store. You know, I want to buy this, 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 this. And I was, because <laughs> I used to work in my store too. That was like another um, thing that I really enjoyed doing because it made me close to my customers and I could get their yeah. feedback right away. Um, but yeah, I happened to be in there and then she, I have a photo with her, I think. I was like, can I take a picture with you? I know this is like weird, but I want to give you your privacy. She's like, yeah, totally. It's all good. And then she ended up going to the monkey forest and taking some photos with monkeys here in Bali because it's like a big thing. Oh, like they go okay. to the sacred monkey forest and she has like a selfie with a monkey and then you could see like our logo. Oh, which wow. Is so funny. Oh, <laughs> so, my gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... I don't even know a list of celebrities. There's been I think you had Miley Cyrus. I think yeah, when I met, Miley. met you, yeah, Miley wore it. And then yeah. I think I remember oh. the Cara Delevingne one too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. The I think the recent one this year was the Harley Quinn movie because oh. she wore um she wore like the pink bra, which is pretty funny because we had the showroom in LA and um, a stylist made an appointment and she was like, I need this bra. I need 10 of them. And we're like, wait, I don't even know if we have 10 of these or, you know, we have to check. And she was like, yeah, I want to order them as well, but is it okay? Like, do you have some without the logo? I'm like, no, we don't do them without the logo. So either you have to buy this one or we don't do it. She's like, no, that's fine. Like, just let me know if you have like 10 or I don't remember 10 or 15. So we found the stock and then, um, so she ended up buying it and then we forgot. And then I think early this year, the movie came out. Yeah, it came out in February. And I had a bunch of people land on the website. And the thing is in the movie, wow. they actually blurred the logo. So I don't even know how they found oh, it, but I really? guess like fans are really fanatic. Yeah, which I guess because we didn't sign a waiver. Although if they asked us, I would have signed it. It would be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it would have been better to have your logo in the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but I don't know how they found us because I had a bunch of people on the website. And, you know, we had a, uh, this bra. It was from 2018 and the movie came out early this year. So, you know, we're not even remaking it again. So it's kind of like old season, I guess. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so... Yeah, so they, they're they like, oh my God, do you know, do you have this size? Well, blah, because blah, a lot of the sizes are sold out. So we ended up like making a smaller order. But yeah, all these Harley Quinn cosplay girls ended up purchasing this one style because they want to look like Margot Robbie in the movie. Wow. <laughs> so I'm expecting now that it's October and it's Halloween, it's going to have another surge. Yeah. So I'm getting ready for that. But yeah, that, that was really funny because I completely forgot about that. And then I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, the movie. And we ended up watching the movie and it was in like the scene where she's in the nightclub and it was only like two minutes. No, but that's but, still enough. <laughs> yeah, Sounds it's still like. enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love Margot Robbie. So I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I love her. Yeah, <laughs> it, it also just goes to show how like you got to be ready. Like if yeah. some if some celebrity walks in or their stylist contacts you and they're like, I want 20 of this, you gotta be like yeah. ready to go for it. And and it sounds to me like you should just always say yes. Like if they're like, Oh, do you yeah. have this? Yes. You know, yes. Right? <laughs> even, yeah. if, even if you've never even or you're on your last piece or whatever, like, of course we have that. That's what it kind of sounds yeah. like to me. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You have to be prepared. I've always found it that things like this always happen with the pieces that maybe you're not really like 
you're not really into it and you're not Mm -hmm. stocking a lot of it and it's just funny because yeah this was like an older collection and we only Mm -hmm. had I mean we still had pieces but I wasn't really focusing on actually you know putting another order for it and she you know I guess Harley Quinn she wears pink so it's her color Mm -hmm. but yeah it just completely slipped my mind so it was definitely a nice surprise because you know, you forget about those things, especially yeah. now with influencer marketing, it's a little bit different. Oh, yeah. You expect things to be instant, you know? Yeah. So yeah, a lot has changed since I started the brand and the way that everything works now. Yeah. And that's actually a perfect segue into my next question. Uh, because you have experienced so much, um, I would love for you to talk about uh, what's upcoming there's so many things happening right now with yeah. the economy and the pandemic and and also yeah. just the industry shifting to more of a digital you know there's some mm-hmm. brands who just start right with an e-commerce store without even trying to get into retail I would love yeah. for you to talk about this upcoming year and what you think that the fashion industry will go through how it will change um, as well as how uh, people can adapt to the changing industry along with the pandemic and even just the, the direction it was going before the pandemic yeah. came. Yeah. The trend that uh, fashion is going into even before the pandemic is sustainable fashion because consumers are becoming more educated about the fashion industry and the negative impact that it has. You know, fashion, um, you know, like it's not really the most environmentally friendly industry and now consumers they're just more um, aware of all these things even with their diets and you know people don't want to um, support plastic bags and you know even now we're in Bali like everyone uses reusable straws and all of that people are just more conscious mm-hmm. about the environment and I think that's great and it's a good global movement and I see that it's been uh, affecting fashion as well and positively influencing that so that's the trend that I think is going to be uh, more apparent now with the pandemic as well, because, you know, people are not going to be, well, with the pandemic, first of all, everyone's at home. So we're not shopping, you know, as many like styles or looks like we would if we were to go out. Like a lot of times, even me, I was this person too. I would just buy something and I would wear it once. Mm. Or, you know, you would buy something. You're like, I already have a cute photo in it. I don't want to wear it again. You know, so people were buying just uh, not really buying consciously and also not buying things that they want to keep for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's where the fast fashion, fast fashion was really capitalizing on that. Right. And social media was also kind of perpetuating that as well, especially in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. So with fast fashion brands, everything is so cheap. But all of this stuff, it ends up in the landfill or it's, you know, producing such a like negative impact in terms of water pollution, air pollution, even like the carbon footprint that it sets. So I do see that the younger generation, they are now more aware of this. And I think with the pandemic, because we're all having to slow down in all areas of our life, you know, fashion is not going to be the same anymore as and that that's applies to other businesses as well. So now with, you know, everyone focusing on going online, I think fashion, I mean, if you're opening um, a store now, it's definitely risky. So if you were to have a brand, you would go online first and find your audience that way. Um, I mean, when I started, I didn't have Facebook or, I mean, Facebook marketing or Instagram. So like finding your audience had to be through being in a brick and mortar store Mm -hmm. And, you know, you weren't paying for ads and all of those things. Um, So nowadays, it's a little bit different because you can find your audience and target them. And that's all through just being on your phone or on your computer. So I think fashion nowadays, it's going to be more mindful. Um, I see also like uh, my friend that has a fashion brand in LA, he has a store, but they're doing VR, like virtual reality. Mm. which is really cool. So you can try on the clothes. I don't know how he does it, but he has that technology. So fashion is going to go and, you know, I think have some technological advances influence that as well, whether, you know, it's through like a VR app or maybe, you know, uh, I think online, I see some brands now where you can upload your photo and you can see how you would look like. So that's one thing that I think 
um, fashion is going to move into, especially for luxury brands, Mm -hmm. because luxury brands will have that capacity, right, to be on the front line with technology and try to um, work with that for, you know, for a a way to have customers um, be able to, like, try things on and then make the purchase, because at this point, I don't think anyone's really going to be shopping in, in stores anymore as much as before. Mm-hmm. I even heard in New York that um, a lot of stores are closing at this, you know, because of the pandemic and they're probably not going to reopen because rent is so high and it's not right. sustainable. So that's why I think fashion is going to be, yeah, it's going to be completely different. So I think with the pandemic and people realizing that they don't really need to leave their house to buy anything and fashion, of course, is not really a necessity item. People are going to be flocking more online and then with the new technologies such as VR shopping and, you know, even now you can live stream a show and you can do that from the comfort of your home. So you don't really need all of those other frills, right? So I think people are more aware of this and they also know like Fashion Week, it's such a, not not to say that it's a waste of money, (laughs) but all that traveling and everything, it really is wasteful and I think the pandemic is really making people rethink about how we can minimize our waste and waste is not just trash, you know, it's just waste in terms of um, like carbon footprint, you know, even like your buying, uh, your spending habits and how can we be more minimal and be more kind to our environment and be more mindful. So I think that's where the industry is going. So I think there's going to be a lot more sustainable fashion and a lot more technology helping uh, people shop in a different way. Yeah, I love what you mentioned about the virtual reality and the technology, because that's something we've seen in so many other industries and seeing it now manifest in fashion, like even just the thought of being able to like, just see something where you're wearing the clothes (laughs) without feeling like that on. I think that's super exciting. And I definitely look forward to seeing uh, more of that. And like you mentioned, that's also- more sustainable in, in so many different ways, uh, because yeah. as a, as a consumer, you don't have to travel to go try things on. You're not wasting gas. Yeah. You're not creating traffic. Um, and then also yeah. too, it gives more access to people as well to, you yeah. know, be able to try that product. And therefore as a, as a manufacturer, or as the, the founder, you can predict how much inventory you have to make and things like that. So yeah. I feel like there's so yeah. many different ways, um, that yeah. uh, is beneficial. And then also too, I would love for you to, to cause I know we were talking about the retail versus the e-commerce. So would you say that there's, uh, I don't wanna say no points, but is there <laughs> any purpose to people or designers trying to get their, their clothing still into stores or get shelf space for their you know, accessories or yeah. whatever it is? Do you think that going into next year, is there really much purpose or should, is that something that should just be on the back burner and focus more yeah. on the digital? I think it's not going to completely go away. I do think it's good for businesses to have a little bit of both, but you have to be kind of ready to pivot, you know? So Um, Of course, wholesale is not the way that it used to be. And especially with stores not being able to open, you shouldn't be focusing on that. But I got a wholesale order last month and it was a pretty big order through this website called FAIR. And I was really surprised. So, you know, you have to just be ready for both. Like what you said with the stylist, even like if someone's coming in and knocking on your door, be prepared for that because it is another distribution channel that you can rely on but you shouldn't just rely on it. So I think, you know, for me, um, when I first started, I was just relying on wholesale. I wasn't even thinking about e-com and all of that. I don't even believe Shopify existed back Mm. then or they were really new. Yeah. So then when Shopify did, you know, like pop up and before that our website was fully 100% coded. And then when Shopify came, it really changed the game because then anyone can really just open up their online store so I think, you know, as a business owner, you just have to be ready and, and kind of, you know, go on the next trend, or if it's not a trend, at least like the new advances. So, you know, you shouldn't just rely on one stream or like one channel because you never know what's going to happen. And I think that's also what the pandemic is really teaching a lot of people and a lot of businesses that we can't rely on this way of the, you know, the old way we have to 
figure out like new or diversify our income and diversify our, yeah, like, uh, you know, ways to kind of support ourselves. From what you're saying, it pretty much sounds like it would be advantageous to still like with the wholesale orders, maybe go yeah. for the ones who um, have a big online presence, right? Yes. Then it's yes. like killing two birds with one stone. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you're still getting the wholesale orders, but instead of maybe getting it in a lot of boutiques, which people might have done back in the day, it's you know okay. better for you to, to be in those stores that have an online yeah. presence, a digital presence. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to actually add this in because this is really interesting. Um, before when you had to show your collection to buyers, it would have to be in a trade show or you invite them to the showroom and they would come and they would, you know, look at the pieces and place yeah. their order and they would place it like on a piece of paper, you know, it's not digital. <laughs> but now um, it's, it's completely different. I'm actually doing a digital um, show tomorrow with buyers in Europe. So it's going to be through Zoom and oh, wow. it's, uh, yeah, it's only for sustainable fashion brands and this um, showroom in Europe, they're hosting this eco, eco week, they call it. Uh -huh. So if you are a brand owner and you want to showcase uh, your collection, they give you a 10 to 15 minute spot. So you can basically set up your rack and then show like your, your collection through Zoom. So it's a it's definitely the new way. And I think, I think it's great. You know, it saves yeah. more time and you don't, you know what, another thing, you're not going to have to pay so much on transportation and yeah. flying. I, I used to fly to trade shows and it was a lot, you know, and that's like an expense that you can cut back. If you're a small business owner, that's a great, you know, great way to still be in touch with your market, but you don't mm -hmm. actually have to to pay all this money for you know things that are not really useful for these days yeah that reminds me too of uh, uh right when the pandemic started some of the the fashion shows they went straight to virtual and we're just having their whole fashion yeah. show virtual which i think that's probably yeah. something people sh should prepare to do moving forward right yeah yeah i agree um i want to talk about your course now because your course is so valuable okay. it teaches so much from literally from inception to uh you know manufacturing branding and design distribution like the full journey of your your product um can you talk about your course and uh how it helps people yeah um so my course um it's an eight-week online accelerator program and it basically will teach you how to start your own successful fashion brand also if you want to create a sustainable fashion brand so I cover everything from branding and strategy to company setup um, to, you know, uh, setting up your finances as well and your, your cash flow and how oh, to wow. do all your costing and logistics. And then, of course, we go into product development and designing, especially if you are not a designer and I'm not a designer. So I put a lot of my hacks in there and then uh, we cover sampling and production as well because if you want to create a cut, cut and sew collection and how to do that effectively and we also do uh, I also cover digital marketing and email marketing and what a lot of uh, people are excited about that have signed up is about the traditional marketing how to get celebrity placement because they see that I did that for my brand so they really want to learn that so I teach yeah. that part as well and then sales strategies so it's an eight-week course. I, I know I'm putting in a lot of information <laughs> to eight weeks. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this course because it's basically 10 year, uh, my 10-year experience of being a fashion, uh, a brand owner and also a fashion consultant, uh, ethical garment producer, like all those different perspectives that I have. I'm taking all of the knowledge from, from all my businesses and I'm putting this into this course. So I'm really excited and I really hope that um, I'm going to teach a lot of people and help them with their brands. And you have a, a two week uh, early bird special, right? Yeah. So the early bird special is uh, $6.99. So we're launching that and it's going to end October 24th. And basically the course is eight weeks, but you can obviously like, you don't have to take it within eight weeks. If, uh, if you can, then it's great. I wouldn't say rush through it. So eight weeks is the minimum, 
but I understand people are busy and it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, you have to commit to it and, and really do it. And you can do it uh, alongside as you're building your brand as well. Now um, there's live calls with me as well. So there is a members only community on Facebook. So we're going to help each other through this journey because, you know, as an entrepreneur, it can be lonely. Um, you know, especially if you, your friends are not entrepreneurs or they don't do the same thing as you, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be a lonely journey. So part of the course as well is that I'm building a community and we're going to share our, you know, our struggles, our wins and all of that in this um, group. And I have the live calls to basically give them more of more of my personal guidance. And if they have any, you know, trouble or, or just if they, you know, need some specific guidance on their sampling or their production, I'm, you know, I'm always there. So it's not just a course, it's basically a, a support and they have access to this content, which I will also be updating continuously because fashion is always changing. It's crazy how much it has changed in the past 10 years that I've been in the industry. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, you know, new chapter because um, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess the pandemic really inspired me to do this. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. You know, there's so many people that want to start brands and I saw this trend as well because in my production company, I had a lot more inquiries when the pandemic hit. And first I was really I was really scared because, you know, I have my factory workers and I did not want to let anyone go. So for the first month, we did have to close, but thankfully I didn't let anyone go. But for the first month, because of the pandemic, we need to take, you know, health and safety measures. So we, we had to close. And then after we followed or we set up new protocols, but I just couldn't close for too long because of all the inquiries. And a lot of them were um, small, uh, small brands or startup brands. And I guess everyone, everyone's more, you know, they, they want to, they, they want to get, get, get away from their nine to five job and start their own business. Mm -hmm. So I think the pandemic has inspired a lot of people to tap into their creativity and also, you know, kind of prepare for a rainy day. Who knows if this happens again, right? So right. Everyone now also thinks like, you know, working remotely or having their online business is something that they can rely on. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I saw this uh, trend with my production company. So that's, that was, um, I'm really appreciative of that because I, I was able to grow my team even more during the pandemic because I needed extra sewers and another production manager to just to help with the workload. And then now that I, um, I'm doing the course, I basically see that, you know, all these startup brands, they are um, struggling with certain areas of maybe their development and all of those things that I basically um, offer like as a solution to my clients, I'm covering this in the course as well. Wow. So I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, you, you have a lot to offer. There's also your YouTube channel, which I will put a link to that. Oh yeah. Uh, below <laughs> as well that people can, can, can check out. Um, yeah. that's, that's actually going to wrap up part one of this okay. episode in part two, though, we have some really cool things we're going to talk about. I want to hear your, your mistakes that you typically oh, yeah. see people make. <laughs> I'd love for you to reveal that so people can learn from that. Uh, yeah. you also talk about, uh, how the fashion industry works in reality versus what people expect. Um, I think that would be really helpful for people to hear, um, you know, how things yeah. actually turn out, how they can prepare for it. I wanna ask you a little bit about using social media as well, because I know that was something you had to adapt to as it grew, yeah. as well as your, your final tips for success. So okay. everybody listening at home, if you guys could head over to lagoals.com for part two. See you over there. <laughs>